Welcome to that Grief Relief Podcast. I don't know what episode number this is because I don't know what episode number I'm actually going to put it out on. But I will tell you that back by popular demand from episode two is my big brother, Russell Overy. I think one person said something positive like about my input. <laughs> Should I do it right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that could be popular demand. <laughs> Or is well, that based on the percentage of your listeners? <laughs> yeah, popular demand, one person. 50% of my audience <laughs> voted you to come back. Um, I will just say that Russell has come around my house with his dog Stanley and my cat Poppy has never really seen a dog before and certainly not in the house. So there's a lot of noises happening in the background. There's a big standoff going on. And he just stares at cats. He doesn't know what to do with them. Listen. Like, pardon me. That was, <laughs> I, yeah. I've had lunch. Right, okay. So in episode two, we spoke about um, the night that dad died and the experiences and stories all um, revolving that. But of course, we also lost our mum, which Oliver, our little brother, has spoken about. Why is that funny? Why is that funny? It's really not funny. I mean, I know this is a lighthearted podcast about death. I don't know why. Just the way you said it, my mind was, (laughs) we've lost it. Where is she? I can't find it. Under the cushion. Where was the last place you saw it? I always used to have that when I worked in estate agents and people would say to me like, oh, we're looking, you know, I've just lost my mother. And I'm like, careless. (laughs) Right, stop it. So, because Mm. I did episode one with Oliver where he spoke about mum dying, but obviously it's your mum too, and we haven't spoken about that. She was my mum first. She actually was, yeah. Yeah. It's not a competition. Didn't say it was. (laughs) Life is a competition. Absolutely. Right, so tell me out, tell me about the. Well, I guess, yeah, the night that mum died, how you found out, what happened, and the story around it. I was in bed and um, I had the phone by the side of the bed and I got that phone call that I think we all dread, three o'clock in the morning. Mm. <clears throat> and I picked my phone up as Oliver and I, as soon as I saw it, I knew, I can't say I knew that she was dead, but I knew that something bad had happened to her. <laughs> that was one of the noises I made. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so the, I, I knew straight away and answered the phone. Um, I might even just said, tell me, I can't remember, but I said, hello. But it was like one of those moments where you're instantly awake. Yeah. Like, you know, and he said, oh, you know, mum's had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, and at that stage, I don't even know if the ambulance crew had arrived or, or were they there and they're working on that. Up once again, a bit sketchy, but he rang and said that she had a heart attack, but she hadn't been declared dead yet. So right. once again, you know, it was a question of, I don't know, I've not much else I can tell you, but I need to let you know uh, what's going on. So of course I was up um, with, with my wife at the time, Tina, we were immediately booking flights and, and you know, we had a baby. Mason was what, he was nine months old at the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah eight, nine months old. And obviously, I mean, he was asleep, right? So. Mm-hmm. But I remember that that <clears throat> between kind of maybe three three thirty to almost like five o'clock in the morning. It was just this waiting game, and I think I'd already booked a flight by the time Oliver called back. And I remember picking up the phone and went, and I think then I said, "Tell me," and he went, "She's gone." And I just remember, it's a very weird thing to talk about and to express, but I remember dropping my phone and covering my eyes, and I didn't feel anything. Mm. it was it was numb and I remember covering my eyes thinking I should feel something right now I should I should be like distraught Mm. um but I didn't and that's that's not that because I didn't care or Mm. anything like that it was just that was my immediate reaction Mm. and I thought about that a lot over the last few years in terms of was was it shock maybe but I kind of knew for the last hour and a half two hours it was most likely going to be the outcome. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it was delayed. I, I don't know. But that's exactly what happened. So so phone call was in bed. And then by the time he rang to tell me that she'd actually passed away, um, I was sitting downstairs on the sofa. And yeah, so I, I remember just dropping the phone into my lap. And, and it was almost like in the moment, I was like, I need to react somehow. It was almost mm. like I was thinking about it rather than just living what whatever was happening. So, 
yeah, it was quite a strange experience that, and, and once again, it does come back into this thing of, well, am I doing this because it's not real? I'm, I'm, I'm in denial mm. over this, which is, you know, often a first stage, but yeah. So, so I do remember that being quite a strange moment as it start, you know, started to then yeah. sink in. Cause you, so you were in Dubai. Correct. You were living in Dubai and mum was the first parent to pass away. So this was May, 2010. Yeah. Um, if you haven't been listening to the other episodes and then dad was after that. Was this your first death? Like serious death, close death, if you like? I mean, obviously your mum and your dad are the most like impactful, but was it your first death that you dealt with full stop kind of? No, I don't think so. I mean, I had Nana Alice. I didn't, my dad's mum, she died when I was Your dad's mum. 11. Mom. What did I say? <laughs> you said my dad's mum. My dad's mum. Our dad's mum. <laughs> yeah. But do you, oh, do you like remember that? Yeah, then? yeah, I remember that. I oh. remember that once again vividly. Oh, okay. Um, once again, she had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, and our last words were, "Oh, Lil, who was Ooh, her sister." Yeah. Um, and we drove straight up there, and the neighbour round. He'd been trying to do, you know, CPR yeah, and stuff. And, yeah. And then I remember we 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 drove back from from Hounslow back down to Battle, and I was sitting in the back of Dad's Monza. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, I'll tell a lie. I was sitting in the in the front, and Mimi. Auntie Lil was Nana's, Nana's sister, sister who lived together for well, since the war, basically. Yeah. Um, she was in the back. And I remember coming down the 8100 just to begin to battle. And I said, Dad, I'm going to be sick. Yeah, oh, right. Open the window, puked out the window all over Mimi. You're joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What? You know, the two door cars. Have, yeah, you know, yeah. So obviously, I wasn't out far enough and we were doing whatever it was, six yeah. mile an hour down the road. So it just blew back in. Was I in the car? Um, you must have been. I mean, I must have been. Because mum was there. Um, <clears throat> he just left me at home. Yeah, I mean. I must have been. I, I was eight, I think, maybe seven or eight. I was eight. 11, so you would have been seven. Seven, okay. Yeah. And then, of course, then Mimi died. Shortly after. A f- yeah, a few years later. Because you were about A couple of years, somewhere. yeah. Only a couple of years. Um, and she had a stroke. And I remember going to see her in hospital. Same. And it, was, it was strange seeing her after she'd had a stroke. She'd lost a lot of function. And they were always really well made up, and you know, hair was always in bonnets and sprayed and stuff like yeah. that. And, yeah. And she like she looked like a the wild woman of Borneo. Yeah. Right? And it was really weird. And obviously, she couldn't communicate and speak, but you could see that she was really happy to see us. Mm. And I thought she was on, you know, we were, well, I thought that she was on the mend. Mm. Um. And then, and then, I think she had another stroke. Um. So yeah, I mean, that, they're the two kind of significant people ones. Um. And then obviously losing a couple of dogs, which. Yeah. Depends on how you're wired to your dogs. Oh, absolutely. I can't compare that, um, but it is still a process of mourning and grief. Yeah, for sure. So, and now like, looking back on it now and since mum dying, obviously dad's passed away as well. Do you think that was shock? You, your kind of numbness? I don't know. I mean, we're talking 10, 11 years in a couple of months mm. and... I, I still don't know what the answer to that would be. I, you know, if I described the symptoms and, and kind of replayed my m- my memory of it, which of course is never reliable for anybody, um, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, Stan has just walked back into the lounge. Carry on. You know, maybe a counsellor psychotherapist whatever would be able to label that mm. and say that would just be under what we define as shock maybe <clears throat> i don't know I, th- I think i had um certainly more so than than you and oliver i think i had a more <sighs> complicated maybe is an overly complex word but i think i had a complicated relationship with mum more so than you um because i didn't live with her after mum and dad got divorced yeah and and you were how old uh well i was 11 when they split up mm-hmm. Um, and and Oliver talked about this a little bit in the last episode that he was on because that might have been 10 episodes ago now yeah right? who knows when I'm going to put this out um, episode 8 episode 8 and he was talking about you know how on reflection he could see how mum made it may have made it difficult for his dad to be in his life okay um, I 100% recognise that mm-hmm. um, with mum and it's, it's not that she made it difficult for dad's being in in our lives because one i don't think my dad would have accepted that ever mm, mm. um but also the fact that i, I remember once again when they got divorced like, i'm gonna stay with my dad it was the first thing i remember saying when they told me and we were standing in the hallway Do you remember that horrible red carpet we yeah. had to hoover every five days because yeah. every five minutes because of the dog <clears throat> um 
and and I was adamant that I was I was going to live with my dad. Um, so, but when I used to go around there, literally it was every other weekend, right? Um, when you used to go around mums to mums, yeah. yeah, and mine, and and once again for me, it never felt like home mm -hmm. i remember the first time she said do you want to come and see the house that you know they bought she bought everything i didn't want to go i didn't want to see it I wasn't interested in any anything. really yeah, not how interesting and i never felt and once again because i didn't live there when i stayed there my bedroom was this little box room at the top of the stairs and so i never felt it was like my space no um and i you know i'd go there to see my mum um and and you i guess as well thanks um, <laughs> and just to write on your posters on your wall and stuff and uh I think the way mum used to speak to me about dad, you know, one of the things she used to say was, oh, what's your father doing? And it was almost like she used the word father, almost like a, it's like a bit of a swear word. Yeah. But she used to spit and, and it used to land, you know, I remember as an 11 year old, that lands heavy. Mm. And it's only, you know, reflecting on that over many years. I mean, this is what, you know, now 32 plus years ago. Yeah. Um, that I can kind of look at that and I know it coloured the way Maybe not the way I felt about my mum, because she was my, you know, I loved her. I, I you know, it wasn't like I, I ever got to a stage where I didn't like her or I hated her or anything like that. No. But I, I never felt completely comfortable being around there because I was on a little bit edge. It was like I felt like I had to defend my dad. Yeah. And for whatever reasons, they got divorced. Both of them, um, you know, contributed to that as always is the case. Yeah. But um, I because of that uh, and you know oliver talked about seeing his dad less and less and particularly as i got older and, and i you know i started to drive and have a car and stuff like that i used to kind of go around there less because i could pop in when i wanted rather yeah. than to stay for the weekends <clears throat> and stuff um and then once again when when oliver's dad came on the scene once again that was an, something else that i just was not engaged with at all and what, not once again not not because it was like oh he's replaced my dad that was never the case but you know, and and I'll say this because Oliver knows this, but I I never liked him, mm. uh, and it, just just of, because of how just how he was, and 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 so, you know, I I it almost it sounds terrible. I I I tolerate him more than anything else because he was my mum's husband and Oliver's dad. But you know, particularly for a, a teenage boy as well, mm. he was he was a figure and a personality that I just. Uh, we, we never saw eye to eye completely different setup so coming back to the point of of potentially coming back to your question about was it shock you know over the last 10 years or so i have reflected on how much of my reaction was a shock and how much was it actually i i wasn't as close to my mum oh he's going to start barking now he's trying to get to play you see how, how much <laughs> how much of of that was based on relationship with my mum and the weird thing was she when she moved down to Bournemouth <laughs> Stan actually now wants Poppy to play okay yeah. we'll just carry on that's fine um you know it was a two-hour drive so once again I saw her less and less but that I think actually improved our relationship and once again I never had a bad relationship with my mum no. it wasn't broken or anything like that I, I think the easy way to say it is that if if you know my, my comparison in terms of my relationship with my dad I always felt closer to my dad particularly after their divorce mm. than I did with my mum mm -hmm. and um for, for whatever reason and once again I would have contributed to that as well you know yeah um, yeah for sure so but but when when she moved down and then it was a question of we'd go down there every so often and I'd maybe stay for four or five days sometimes a week ago so I'd spend more time with her and it's important to mention that when mum moved to Bournemouth which is sort of two two and a half hours away is because that was because she divorced from Oliver's dad yeah so yeah. do you think do you think that that also improved your relation again and that's what I'm saying it strengthened the relationship did. it okay. absolutely did and, and and you know leading up to when I mean certainly when she died it was we were probably in the best and once again, we didn't have a bad relationship. No. It wasn't like we didn't speak for years or anything no. like that. But we were probably the closest we've been for for, for a long time, maybe ever. Mm. And you'd become very close because of Mason, because of your son as well, hadn't you? Like yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, to, 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 a, uh, to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, there wasn't a huge amount of time between him being born and her passing away. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, so potentially could be shock. Potentially, it was because it could have been... What, what was you know and once again was that almost like guilt I should feel more about this but because of the relationship that I perceived to have with my mum maybe it was a uh, a bit of a a reaction of like 
what, what should I what should I be feeling right now? Right, okay. And what then happened immediately after that? You booked a flight, mm. you flew back to the UK. Yeah. And what was waiting for you when you got there? I don't remember. I don't remember, you know, once again, there's people that I've listened to in a, in a few of the episodes where people say, I've been on a plane and the girl that had the same stewardess and all the rest mm. of it. It's like, uh, okay, I, I don't remember any of that. I, can't, I vaguely remember being on a plane and feeling quite numb, but I've been on a plane lots. Yeah. You know, and when you're doing... 14 hour flights you just feel numb anyway right so yeah, kind of the yeah, states or yeah, wherever it might be yeah. um so i don't vividly remember the journey i don't remember landing i don't remember how i got down to bournemouth i don't remember any of that um but i, I you know i do remember getting there and being there but i don't remember the point of me dropping the phone and going yeah. i should be feeling something and then getting there being at her front door okay um i must have hired a car because what i do remember was uh driving i think i brought mason with me i don't think or you did, did. Bring no up? i don't think you did because i've got a picture of him and, and nana dorothy so maybe tina brought him over a couple of days later oh uh, you're right and i remember driving and and the road to get to mum's used to come past the whatever the royal hospital in bournemouth mm. and the tesco and i remember driving past there and speaking to i think was it oliver i was speaking to saying uh, where are you? Are you still at the hospital or wherever? And I remember driving past there and thinking, my mum's in there. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and then drove to the house. And then that, I remember that and Dorothy was downstairs um, in her like dressing gown and stuff. And she was obviously a complete mess. And, mm. um, Oliver's there. I, I, <clears throat> I remember him being, um, and once again, I might completely be misremembering this, but I remember him being uh, quite together yeah like, like with it like like not in pieces and, and stuff like that because my expect not what my expectation was but i think a lot of the time being the oldest there is a sense of i need to show up for everyone you know i need to carry mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. the burden or whatever um and oliver was 18 at the time yeah yeah, you know, once again, so he was a, a, a you know a young adult, and you know he was going through a transition of going to the university, and you know, or prepping for that four or five months later, and yeah, um, oh, these animals are weird, aren't they? That's fine. Yeah, just so, leave, leave the the animals. It's fine. So yeah, I I don't remember too much about once again being there, but I do remember driving past the hospital, and then Mum's what five minutes. Mum's house was what five minutes. Yeah, from if there. that around the corner. Yeah. Um, and and getting there, and then. I think Auntie Jane was down as well by there. I think she was still at the hospital, actually. I don't know. I Once remember again, Auntie Jane I, being there when I got I, there. I, was I there when you arrived? Yes. Right, okay. Um, so I, I can't remember the, the, those details. What I do remember, more than anything else, is in that aftermath, is me going to a place like mentally, uh, I guess, and emotionally, but more, more, more mentally, which is completely against how I'm wired which was super organized and structured and 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 it was almost like the way i dealt with that grieving process was to and i've said this before almost like to project manage mm. her yeah funeral and and everything it was weird to see as well it was weird to mm. see from the outside because exactly as you said you're not organized in that way and it was just you were just on absolute autopilot no i wasn't it was the opposite of that sorry you uh, yeah actually you, no you're absolutely right and and, and so you, know, you were so focused on the detail mm. and, and, the and admin. that's thing i i don't i, I don't do detail at all mm -mm. <clears throat> but the fact that you know on reflection i think it was my way of getting through it and mm -hmm. i mentioned this briefly you know once again do, working somewhat with change management and we we use a couple of models which like i said before are based on this uh, grieving process that was developed by a woman called elizabeth kubler ross and it's the classic or what's now known as the five stages of grief um can we touch on that because you... not now because now you're gonna ask me i'm gonna forget at least one of them but oh really only because you said exactly the same in episode two and i said touch on it and quite a few people messaged me and said i wish russell had gone further and spoken about that It'll... We'll come back to it. All right, okay. I will. I will. But but literally, first stage is, that, that that's mapped out in her model, 
And bear in mind, it is a model. Doesn't mm. mean as a, and I said this before. It doesn't mean that you go through it in a certain time frame, yeah. or you go through the stages in a linear process. Mm -hmm. You can be stuck at one stage. You can go backwards. You can jump stages. Yeah. But essentially, there's these five um, five stages. The first one is denial, um, usually, uh, and then followed by anger mm -hmm. or, or some kind of usually kind of negative reaction to it. Why? You know why? Those kind of things. Um, but for me. And I remember, I do remember thinking exactly this. I know those five stages. I'm going to force myself through it. Mm. I'm literally going to force myself through it. Mm. Yeah, okay. I remember, yeah, it was a bit weird at the beginning when I dropped the phone. So that's my denial piece. Um, so, you know, I'm going to get angry at some stage. And I remember really losing my shit at the dinner table with you and Oliver. One, they were all sitting around Nana, Dorothy and Auntie Jane who was obviously mum's mum and, and mum's sister and you were <coughs> Oliver and I think we were talking about maybe music for a funeral and you two were really like making a lot of uh, jokes and stuff about it and not about her funeral just about some of the songs and stuff and, and I remember literally losing it I f throwing something across the room and I had to I got up and left the house I had to leave the house you, I, don't, you I, don't remember that I, only now that you've mentioned it I vaguely remember it yeah um, so you know so that was there but my thing was I'm going to force myself through it um, so the next one of the stages is, is kind of bargaining which is okay so what next how do I move through this and mm. so that for me was like I'm going to get in these folders I'm going to get all these stuff because I mean look she was 60 she wasn't expecting to disappear so her affairs weren't exactly in order no and that's not, she had stuff in place, but it was all over the place, right? Mm, mm. Um, and, and, you know, we found, I found pensions and stuff that no one knew about. I don't whether she knew about it, I don't know. Um, but, but once I dug into it and I was going through public record and all sorts of stuff, um, but I, I really got into this. And that was my process of, I'm just going to force myself through this. Yeah. And I'm going to come out of this having, you know, delivered her funeral to, to have gone through... Um, What's the legal process? Uh, the executor, the wills? Well, I did all that, but there's the term. Oh. That'll come back to me. Probate. Probate. Um, I I'm going to deal that. with all that. Don't even know what probate was. And I was, I'm going to learn this. Blah, blah, blah. I remember going down the funeral directors, you know, kind of sort that out. And it's very much kind of matter of fact. And but I do remember being the funeral directors thinking, I'm going to try and not try, but I'm going to kind of make this a little bit fun. <laughs> <laughs> because like I said, I think I've said this before, but every funeral director I met, and a lot of them used to come in the pubs I worked in when I was a kid, they were the funniest people. Yeah. The funniest people. Um, but even when I was kind of making little jokes and, you know, um, nothing inappropriate, but... And he was like, okay, yeah. And it was like, oh, I just... Uh, I, I, you know, for me right then, I would have liked a little bit of banter. But yeah. They were very good, as they always are. Um, you never anyone complain about a funeral director, really, do you? No, why would you? I don't know. I don't know. In case you know, I don't know. There's lots of people people don't complain about. Yeah, but I, yeah, I've never heard anyone say they were terrible. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah, that is true. Or it's like, <laughs> how was the service? Shit. <laughs> like you've never heard that. <laughs> Vicar was awful. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted my money. <laughs> um, so so yeah, I think I think me pushing myself towards that that stage of acceptance was that uh, in my mind i was like i can i can do this it's a process yeah i think what um what's that film it's either analyze this or analyze that uh, yeah. i think it's the second one and um it's robert de niro and not matthew Broderick. billy crystal billy and billy crystal plays the psychiatrist to robert uh, de niro's mafia boss who's going through anger management issues and i think in the second one billy crystal his dad i haven't seen it for years it's either his dad or his mum has died and he keeps talking about grieving is a process grieving is a process um, so if you're ever interested about learning, that's not a bad, okay. bad one to look at. So, you know, for me, it was, I'm going to force myself through this process. Um, and, and that's what I did. And I thought successfully until a couple of years later, I guess, maybe three or four years later. And it was only three or four years after that, that I realized what that had done to me from a mental well-being point of view. Um, because, you know, 2000. 13 14 compounded with other things you know along with you know having two kids at that stage having lost my dad having been made redundant having moved house three times i mean that's everyone in dubai does that every mm. two weeks right mm. but there's so much that had been going on in my life between 2000 in 2008 got married right mm. and then 2009 and a baby 2010 my mum died 2011 
You had a year off. Closed the business. I know you closed the business. That's right. Um, And then started a job. 2012. Lost my job. Lost my dad. 2013. Aston. Started another business. Had a baby. And then 2014, I I kind of went through these these years, which I look back and say, I I don't know if it would be um, clinically described as a breakdown, but that I I know I I was a shell of myself. Mm. Um, I was talking to someone the other day about mental well-being, about this program that, that we run at work, um, this training program. And, and one of the objectives this person's had was, you know, it's because I want to learn more because it's easy to recognize it in yourself but not in other people. When people are having a tough time, low mood or maybe depression, anxiety. Yeah. And I actually said, okay, that's fine. We can work on that. But I'd like to challenge that. I said, because from my personal experience, when you're in it, you don't know you're in it a I lot was of the gonna time. Say, it's I... really difficult yeah. to, to be that mindful that you are in a stage that you can label as low mood or if that's continuing it that moves to depression for example you know and and when you have those moments of or or, or episodes of neurosis it it, uh, i think unless i mean mine isn't what what, what i would refer to as an acute condition okay it might have gone on for a couple of years but it's not something that i experienced throughout my whole life Whereas other people that have that as a chronic condition where they'll experience episodes weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever. But yeah. it's something that's always part of their life. <clears throat> but but for me, my mental health is generally, most of the time, pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it's not, I've always in the past just gone, well, I'm not going to accept that, which is unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did you try and do instead of that? ignore it well no no not not ignore it i tried to to take action you know um and and you know i I forget who said it now and i maybe someone will tell me who quote but there was and it is someone like i don't know nietzsche it's not nietzsche but but it's someone famous and and their quote is when you're going through hell keep going Mm. and the point is if you're going through hell and you stop and you for want of better word give up or quit guess where you're going to be stuck yeah so for me it's it's and that has never informed me just to keep driving forward but i i think my character is one of i can't stop i always have to be moving Mm. it's almost like i've constantly got something to prove to myself more than anybody else but to other people as well Mm. um and and once again maybe the dynamic of being the eldest sibling plays into that um you know, particularly then when you have divorced parents and then you have dead parents and all of a sudden you're, not that it really matters, but you're kind of elevated to this head of the family role. Yeah. Um, and it's not it's not one, a role that I think is even really defined or expected. And it's not one that I rebel against or anything like that. But <laughs> just the look he needs. But it does, you know, it, that that's just how I'm wired. Yeah. Well, there might be other people who could still be that elder sibling, and they get to that stage. It's like, well, and, but for me, I do, I do feel more than responsible, accountable for that. So that that in itself kind of brings its own pressures, and you could sit and argue it's unwarranted pressure and all the rest of it, and and I'd agree with that. Mm. But yeah, it is what it is, mm. and that that that's kind of how I'm wired. So because of that, I need to find ways that I can manage myself effectively. And at the time, I was one naive to the fact that I was probably going through something more serious in terms of, a, of an acute mental health episode. Um, uh, but it did impact my life. It mm. did impact the people around me. It impacted my marriage. It impacted. Um, I I don't think it impacted the relationship with my kids. But it certainly impacted my feeling of self-worth, mm-hmm. um, my feeling of just getting up in the morning f- with a purpose that was bigger than just getting through the day and making sure the kids are okay. Um, and all of that, I can I can kind of link back and say, you know, uh, if I'd have looked at, and once again, this is very much removed from out-of-body experience back in time with your um phd in hindsight and all the rest of it yeah so if if i could have managed and owned i think that's probably the right word owned and admitted to my grief Mm -hmm. i think a lot of that would have been maybe not gone away completely but i think it would have been reduced 
Okay. Um, and, and minimised to a certain extent. So then combining all of that together, so 2014 was the time that you recognised that you were, in your words, a shell of yourself. Yeah, and it might have been before that as well. Um, it might have been before that as well. But but certainly th- th- those, maybe 2012, 13, 14, that, those kind of years. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you deal with that then? I didn't. You didn't? No. What do you mean? As in, I just... And I think I used the example. I just I remember being quite you know low energy a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. I, I'd get up in the morning, go downstairs with Mason, and he's you know he's literally holding on to furniture because he's still learning to walk, or he's <laughs> one of the two. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, and and I'd just fall asleep on the sofa. I was just tired all of the time. No, that can't be right. You mean Aston? No. Mason in 2013. Yeah, but that, right, that, you're that, saying it's before then. I see. Yeah, so I'm saying when I first, when I think back and I started to recognize, right. so that would have been, you know, after Mum died, right. you know, so 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 probably the year, a year later, right. Um, so he was probably about 18 months around that time, you know, when he started walking fully, and it was, it was stuff like that. So, um, it's been a. a, a an interesting process to kind of reflect on that myself mm. um so once again how did i deal with it i didn't seek out any help i didn't feel i needed any help um I- <laughs> stanley we're doing a podcast barking doesn't help he's just telling me he'd help That's all. <laughs> yeah. um so so yeah it was it was literally that i just carried on living my life going to bed and waking up with, with with the mindset of it'll pass i'll get over it and i was right right okay so that's what i was gonna go on to. but yeah gosh no but that's my point if i'd have dealt with it differently i do believe i could have got through it better i think i could have maybe um impacted other people less i think i would have impacted my relationships mm-hmm. less mm-hmm. um so yeah, I mean, I, I think even now there's there's fallout of that that I'm dealing with now. Not mentally, I mean, like in, in my life. Yeah, it's, you know, in terms of like not being focused at work, as an example. Yeah. And then okay, so for those two three years, didn't have great years at work, and as the leader of that business, so to speak, the fish swims and rots from the head, as they say. Right? Yeah. So if if I'm not there, then why how can i expect everybody else to 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 rock up and do that and that once again in itself brings its own pressures because Mm. it's like well i have to be on point a hundred percent of the time Mm. um and and that and that's tough so that's what i mean in terms of things that i'm i'm dealing with now you know in my personal my yeah did you you know the the name of the podcast what was your grief relief for i guess combining because they were so close together by the sounds of it of mum and dad was it just pushing yourself through that process was there anything that you remember that helped you even mildly get out of that no and and that's the thing once again because i was so i mean you could argue definitely naive i was going to say arrogant but that's definitely not the right label but naive enough to go Oh well, I I know this um, psychological model. I've read a white paper on it. <laughs> that must be enough, right? <laughs> um, to 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 kind of go. Okay, well, if there's if if there's stages, if there's a model that I can look at and a framework to go, ah, and I can cognitively connect to that mm, model to mm. say I completely understand from an emotional and an intellectual point of view how that works. And when I read this research, I go, that makes complete sense. So because it makes complete sense and there is a process and a framework and there's loads of case studies that I remember reading and going through and thinking, not, by the way, reading for a professional point of view, not from any grief point of view, yeah. but coming in with that knowledge to go, well, there is a process and there are tools and techniques and ways and sometimes medication, which I've never been involved with. I'm not against it if that's your um, requirement. It's just not something I've ever gone to. Um once again, maybe that's detrimental to my grieving process, right? Maybe that that could have helped. But for me, it's like I don't want to dampen those feelings. I don't want to switch off those emotions, even though they might be raw and painful. Mm. 
for me, that's part of human condition. It really is. And I think, and I'm going to say this carefully because when I say this, this is giving no judgment of anybody else. If someone turns around and goes, I rely on Valium or, or you know, whatever it might be, no issues. I'm yeah. never going to judge you negatively against that because I don't know your experience. I don't know what you've been through. You might not be able to um, literally manage those negative feelings and yeah. emotions. Whereas, whereas for me, it's like a question of, I need to feel that. I have to feel that because if I don't, I don't think I'm actually going to be dealing with it. And once again, that just could be a lack of education on my part. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take something that's going to numb me mm. because for me, uh, and this is the thing, as, as terrible as it is, death is part of life. Yeah. It is absolutely part of life. And, and I think I mentioned it last time, you know, I spent or maybe I didn't, but even as a kid, you know, I grew up in the 80s. And like I said, I was like, I'd lie awake going, nuclear bomb's going to land on my house, right? <laughs> that was the zeitgeist, right? You've never mentioned Did that. Did I not? No. It, it used to keep me awake, like thinking about, my, certainly my parents more than me dying. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting you say that. And I was like eight. I just spoke to someone last week, actually, because we were talking about the podcast. And he said he's never experienced grief. And it, but it's scared him since the age of about eight or nine mm. that his parents are going to die. And that, that's a normal thing. And he's thing. now our age. And that's a normal thing, by the way. That does happen. Some well, people don't... I didn't. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but um, if, if not everyone carries it through into their yeah. 30s, 40s, whatever it might be. But, you know, children go through it. There is a stage of, of child development where they start to realize the difference between fantasy and reality. Okay. So when you have stories about witches and stuff, which is, you know, whatever, wizards and, you know, even Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm. Oh, it's fun. And then they get to this stage where they start to understand, you know, around the ages of four, five, six. I'm sure I'll have some child development person correct me on that. But they get to this stage where they... Or a mummy blogger. Or, yeah. Someone on Facebook that doesn't know Are you. Are they your audience? Mummy bloggers. Yeah. Uh, they might be. Okay. I've got no issues with money, mummy bloggers. No? A lot of them are my friends, but it's the ones on Facebook that like to say things, you know, oh, is your child holding his head up yet? We should, should be and that kind of thing. Oh, those? Yeah. Competitive mums. Yeah, competitive mums. Yeah. Mine was doing calculus at nine months. <laughs> um, jog on, love. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, th I think um, with with that, in mind i'm 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 rambling but i'm trying to get back to 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 your question of of you know what did i do nothing mm. i didn't actively do anything because for me once again grieving is a process it's something that we as human beings over millennia of evolution have grown to dealt with mm. culturally and from a societal point of view don't you look at my foot um, that's not directed at me by the way yeah. um, you know cultures deal with death in, in different ways and, and so, so I'm not saying that as a whole entire species that we, we have this because we don't we don't have even now no you know um, I mean look at even going back to, to Vikings right they they wanted to die because if they were to be killed in battle that's instant access yeah. into Valhalla well, it, and you know there's other belief systems now that yeah. exist that is like okay well that's my passage to redemption yeah um whatever your beliefs it's not my belief system in any way but you know i just like the belief system of the like those cool countries that celebrate at funerals and it's like a big yeah like new orleans a, yeah it's a big yeah. party and which reminds me and, of um the beginning is it, is it live and let die when they're in the funeral procession new yeah. orleans and there's a uh, i think he's a cia spy and he's there and they end up getting killed in the crowd and they just drop the top of the coffin on him and pick him up and carry him away oh, oh, it was God. actually his funeral that he was watching ah that's weird yeah yeah so, um, but yeah, those kind of things. And, and that's, I mean, that a little bit what we did with, with mum, right? Yeah. We didn't kill her and pick her up in a coffin, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a question of when we did her funeral and her wake, it was a question of please don't turn up in black, bright yeah. colours, celebration of life and all the rest of it. Yeah. Whereas dad, on the other hand, was a little bit more traditional like that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and dad 
planned his funeral, which which we yeah. kind of spoke about before, because Dad knew he was dying. But yeah, exactly. And I'm so pleased you've you've touched on on Mum's funeral because it was that we said, please don't wear black, bright colours only. Um, it wasn't in a church; it was in a lovely place down in Dorset, which was it was almost in like an orangery, wasn't it? Like a conservatory area. And bearing in mind this was 2010, you could stream it via webcam if yeah. people couldn't weren't available. And it was very bright, and it was a real like cliche but a celebration of life and it was very it was a humanist ceremony yeah it had no religious no religious connotation connotation, nothing and one of one of the it was it was a a natural burial ground as well so Mm. one of the things you know you it's the first time i'd ever seen it or even heard of them but you could have like the the wicker coffins and stuff that obviously um, decompose decompose over time or the bod pods that turn into trees and, and stuff which i was quite fascinated by um, I'd look up, we need to get the name of it because it was this huge imagine like a huge park and you could have um, benches dedicated to your loved one you could have I mean you could be buried there but there was like a really long waiting list wasn't there all these bod pods as you say you could have the ashes inter- interred is that yeah, the right interned. word In- interned into the ground and it was just it was a, a lovely lovely celebration um, and So it's important to note, our mum and dad, they divorced, uh, they had a very messy divorce, didn't they, in 88, 89? Mm. Very messy divorce. They didn't speak for 18 years outside of a courtroom, something like that. They did, but they just didn't speak to each other very nicely. Very nicely, yeah, that's true. Um, Um, And it it wasn't nice, it wasn't, it wasn't. And once again, just very quickly, circling back onto that, Yeah. once again, the way I experienced and my lens of their relationship post-divorce was I never got any negative stuff from my dad about my mum. No. Um, but I always got it from my mum about my dad, which coloured, once again, which coloured my feelings yeah. towards her. Yeah. Um, and Oliver said the same thing, you know, uh, uh, about him and his dad. So so once again, when, when I say that they, they, I mean, they could tolerate each other to talk about stuff with the kids and, you know, parents' evenings and things like that. But it wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't a nice place for me to be as Same. as a kid yeah, I, I didn't yeah. enjoy them the dynamic and the energy that when they were together no not at all and then um you got married in november 2008 and it was actually mum that rang dad to break the ice because she said well we're going to be at our son's wedding and i feel we needed to break the ice so that was something and actually we <laughs> russell and i have a photograph auntie jane said get together, get together, you two. And it was, it's me, Russell, mum and dad. And Russell and I, you, I'll, I'll have to put the picture up on social media. We're there and we're smiling because it's such an amazing day. And then click, picture went and we both kind of went, that was a bit weird. It was just a bit of an odd, well, it was for me, but I remember looking at you going, that was an odd one. And we've got another picture then with dad's wife, Tina, and then our little brother, Oliver. And it was just a strange, just a strange dynamic. So... That was great. They weren't best friends. They weren't hanging out at the wedding, but it was nice that they'd cleared the air. Then, of course, Mason came along, uh, the first grandchild, and I know that they spoke about that. And I think that was nice that they'd ha- had that then just before mum died. So the reason why I touch on that is because dad was at mum's funeral. Mm. Um, and can you tell the story about you giving mum's eulogy? <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't know about. That. I mean, there was just two parts really that, that yeah. really kind of stick out, and I remember, you know, I because it I, wasn't easy. I wrote it before. Um, you say that I found it easy. Really? Yeah, both of them, but both mum and dad's. Wow. And once again, maybe, and maybe I'm just you know, um, blowing smoke. A friend of mine the other day was telling me about uh. He watched this YouTube video of footballers who were mixing up uh, sayings. And he said, well, I'm just adding in stitches. He goes, well, I'm not blind smoke up my own trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not blind smoke up my own trumpet. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of what I do for a living, yep. and standing in front of groups of people and delivering, you know, presentations and training and all the rest of it. And, you know, I've delivered to big groups, like, you know, a couple of thousand people and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm never phased by any of that. Mm. I was worried about the extra layer of it being my mum's funeral. But I think... Because almost like when I got up there and I've got everyone in front of me, that's like that's a really comfortable place for me okay, to be. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't find that difficult at all. I didn't find writing either of them um, difficult at all. 
when when dad married tina just before he passed away i was his best man i found right in that speech very difficult do you know why because he was going to hear it <laughs> oh, right no, no, no but I, I i mean that because it was like i wrote a few things down and and i had to kind of you know kind of check myself and think is this the appropriate time and stuff like that but I, I, and i didn't i left most of it in and and i tell you this is a bit off topic but i learned my lesson so my friend christian um who we talked about before as well he got married he got divorced and i was an usher and then he got married again and he asked me to be his best man and my opening line that i wrote and i remember sitting around the pool with, with my wife at the time and uh, i wrote this line which was I really want to just say thank you to Christian for making me his best man because I've never been promoted before. <laughs> and I thought that was a nice kind of way to break the ice, to acknowledge the fact that everyone knows he's been married for it. Yeah. But she was like, you can't put that, you can't put that in. That's what Tina said. You can't write that. So I took it out and I always regret taking it out because I dialed my speech back. Down. No way. Um, be- because I was really conscious then of, of, you know, how it land. Now knowing Christian and Christian's wife, Dawn... Do you think it would have landed all right? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I knew that. That yeah. I knew that at the time. Yeah. I knew that at the time. Because one person questioned it, you sort of like... Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, But coming back to the thing, I, to answer your question, I found that quite easy. I found it cathartic. It was a process that, interestingly enough, that helped me. Oh, really? Um, you know, talks about before, I didn't go and see my mum or my dad, you know, in, in the morgue or in the funeral home or anything like that. I don't know if that would have helped, but it was a choice I made at the time and I'm, I'm okay with that choice. But doing those um, eulogies. So at the front, I think there was a screen. Was there a screen at there? And then I'd gone up to the little lectern with the microphone. And like you said, it was like a conservatory. It was all glass windows and mum was laid out in a coffin. Closed, closed casket coffin, yeah. for those Americans <laughs> yeah. listening. That yeah. Oh, look, there's granddad. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and I just took a glass of water up because I didn't know if I was going to get choked up at any stage. And I, I took a sip and I turned around and I went to put the glass down on top of her coffin. And <laughs> I, I I do remember that. Um, and that just, I can't remember what I said. I can't remember what I said. But once again, that just created um, a kind of like a break in the tension, yeah. popped the bubble a bit. You could almost feel in the audience, yeah. you could almost feel everyone go, Okay, like mm. we, we can relax a little bit now. Yeah. I think the rest of it, I've, I, I just had fun with it. Mm. I tell you, you know, when we do presentation <laughs> skills training, one of the things I try to tell people who get really nervous is have fun. And it's a really difficult thing to try and explain. But when I do anything, training from presentations, or anything what it is, uh, you know, where I'm training or do it, I basically use it to try and convince myself that I could have been a stand-up comedian. Right. Right. Okay. So, so I don't write gags, <laughs> but as they come to me, I don't necessarily filter them. And depending on my audience, like one of my favorite clients to work with is a, is a company out here, which is Sirocco, which is basically the Heineken JV. Okay. And they're brilliant. I have so much fun with them. They're, they're, the culture's great. The leadership are fantastic. There's not anyone that I've met in that, in that organization who I just... I don't like, right? No. And I've met them very briefly when they invited oh, yeah. us to the seventh. And we went to the seventh. Very um, nice and, and I was running a, 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 I think it was some kind of sales program for um, for the uh, for, for their sales and marketing teams. And there was like 40 people and it was a big session. And I was talking about building in little rewards for yourself, mm-hmm. right? So either hitting a certain target or managing a time or completing a task. And I said, that could be anything. <laughs> Stanley, that could be anything from, you know, going to have a cup of coffee or booking a holiday to, to Thailand. And and literally, because this was true at the time, I said, my wife just going to Thailand for a week. She's had a really, you know, tough few years. And so she's going to go and do this retreat. And then in my head, I, I, and I didn't filter it, it just came out. And I said, I, I saw her packing the other day. All she was doing was packing ping pong balls. I don't know what she was doing. <laughs> you said this in front of a client? Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> okay. Not just a client, like most of the organization. And like, it killed like they absolutely people were crying with laughter and in that moment i'm like i shouldn't have said that <laughs> right i it was like oh, and i was like kind of hanging my head laughing and and honestly it took us like five or six minutes to get control of the room back because it was just one of those things that just came to me the timing was perfect. yeah the delivery yeah. was great 
So coming back, when I was doing mum's eulogy, I hadn't planned to do anything again, but we talked about like mum marrying Steve, oh, Oliver's please dad. Please do it. Please do it exactly There's as not, you I can't did even it. remember exactly how I I can. But I, I remember roughly, I wouldn't be able to precisely if no. you were to do side by side. But I remember you saying... in and July then, 1991. I was, did I say the date? Do you like? Yeah, you went in July 1991, my mum married Steve Page. Right. And on October of the same year... Yeah, shock. Oliver turned <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> and literally I'm like, I'm looking at you going, you can't say Oliver's <laughs> shotgun wedding because she was up the duff already. <laughs> Oliver is there in pieces, like crying, yeah. sobbing and laughing at the same time. He's super intelligent. He can do maths, right? <laughs> <laughs> he knows the difference between those dates. Yeah, and once again, that, 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 that was... Uh, and the same thing at Dad's funeral when I moved the Bible off the lets and stuff. It just... Oh, my God. I'd forgotten about that. It just... It wasn't... It was never planned, but it was like... Oh, okay. <laughs> and I just... I have to have fun with it. And that... If there's anything... And I know right at the beginning you talked about, you know, dead dad jokes and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, part of that is me using humour. I think I use it in a different way to you and Oliver. Um, to, How to so, do you think? Um... I'm funnier. <laughs> I you were you're that. funnier. No, I thought you were going to say I'm funnier. No, I think I think I think you could argue that yours funny. I think mine's more intellectual. Yeah, I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to question that at all. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't quite know how to label that and, and put an answer on it. But um, I think you guys potentially, maybe I'm missing a more kind of like a more thro- <laughs> Stanley. Would you? Shut your mouth. Um, is more of a kind of a throwaway comment. Yeah. Where whereas mine are I, like, a, and it sounds terrible, but I th- clever. I I, I, I <laughs> yeah. don't know how else more to put it. More intellectual. But um, that makes sense. But but yeah. So so even even giving those eulogies for me, a big part of that process of making mm. it cathartic was expressing myself through humour. Yeah. Um and and you know i like to think of myself as quite funny and and i do i think I, if i could you know i stand in front of people all the time right i could write a joke why don't i just try it but i've never never done well, it well you always say to me let's go and do the stand up comedy like courses but that's very scary but, but I, once um, again i think one, anytime there's anything scary if if you're afraid of anything you you step into it yeah but that's another level isn't it because it's that, that thing of what, as well about fear of rejection and, and all that kind of thing because I'm the, I'm the same because we're very similar and in in my role as a master of ceremonies if you will and I speak I speak to my friend Laura Buckwell who's in the same industry as me and Laura thrives on hosting the most boring events that you can name I'll say to her I'm like oh have you got have you got an event next week and I'm like yeah she'll say yeah what is it she'll be like it's the general consensus and I'm like oh Laura it's so dull but she loves it she thrives on business and finance and something something and she hates doing awards ceremonies which is obviously my jam because there's no substance to it it's easy <laughs> it's literally easy I'm like these are the names this is the winner um but of course, you know, I've done logistics awards. I've launched a new school bus for Tata Motors. For Tata Motors. So, and I'd like to think, actually, I know that I am rebooked and I'm booked because I can add personality to it. I'm not up there like Dave Allen leaning up. <laughs> leaning, God, that was Smoking a reference. Smoking a fag, drinking a scotch. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like a stand-up comedian, but it's just... For those of you who are under... 70 <laughs> Dave Allen Irish comedian yeah anyway um it's just the fact of bringing something to it but you you just said something then about comedy and stand up oh because you touched on it before um in episode two when you came on I think which I'm sure you will agree is the fact that you're you're comfortable with the fact that you were able to make it humorous and 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 what have you because of mum and dad mm. that's the makeup that they gave you yeah I, I i i think so and once again uh, look I, I could be wrong as well but i think there is an element of being british as well we're so you know as, as a culture we're quite self-deprecating mm. and you know often the way we tell someone we like them is by taking the piss out of them mm-hmm. 
um you know and if, if i can take the out of you and we have a laugh together we've now got a, a common bond yeah um how easy is this to edit and beep or cut no i can beep <laughs> <laughs> beep because I was watching this program, it's on Netflix, it's the history of swearing. Swear words. Have you seen it? With Nicolas Cage. Yeah. I've only seen the first one. Which one do you consider the first one? Because I watched them in different orders. But... Well, the first one is f***. Okay. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it. Um, Hang on, do it again. The first one is <laughs> But But there's there's all these American comedians, like this talking heads thing, you know, mm. talking about swear words. And, and there's also uh, PhD people who have researched history of swear words and stuff. But there's this British uh, comedian on there, her name is London. What's her name? Can't remember. But she go, And she said, look, you know, being in America, she goes, you guys treat words differently. She goes, in, in England, he said, it's quite difficult. You can come out and see your neighbour and go, morning, you f***. And it's, like, <laughs> it's like, all right. Whereas here, then it's like you're getting shot in, in the face. So <laughs> I, the, the, I, I think the point being is, is I should leave a gap so you can. Is that going to cause an issue? Just wait for it to go down a little bit as you were self-editing anyway. Well, it's a masonry drill. They're going to be a while. No. It'll start up again. Anyway. Um, yeah, but I think part of that self-perceived Britishness is is kind of dealing with, with, with that. And that's not to say everyone from the UK would deal with that. <coughs> Cut it out, please. Would deal with that in the same way mm. uh, that, that we do. Because obviously you have culture as an umbrella and then you have different cultures within countries counties and towns and schools and organizations and families yeah you know it's a set of rules and norms that are agreed to by the participants of that group right but you know certainly the culture within our family <clears throat> was very much like jokes first right yeah um so once again com combining that with just a comfort of being able to speak in front of people to the question you asked me 45 minutes ago i found it easy and cathartic that helped my grieving process I thought you were going to say, and so to answer your question, Oliver rang me <laughs> <laughs> and said, mum's had a heart attack. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I think, I mean, I think we've kind of touched on everything because I know it was, a, and that's the reason I wanted to, for you to come back on because I know we touched on your grief process after dad. And so I know that the two have kind of come together, but I wanted to know your, me stop annoying the cat. I wanted to know your memories of the, you know, the phone call and everything you got from mum. Yeah. Um, because I know what we're going to do as well in a few weeks time is because I still haven't told my story either regarding mum and dad and other loss I've had. So, uh, so Russell is going to be interviewing me, which is going to be fun. You said that like it's not going to be fun. No, I think it will be fun. Okay. I mean, what's not fun about death? Nothing. It is like I said. It is. It is part of life. It's the one. It's the one date destiny we all have, and, and, mm. and the rest of it. Mm. Um, and 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 oh, what did I, I hear? A great quote the other day. I might look it up properly, and then you can put it in properly <laughs> rather than editing the mess that I'm about to give you. Okay. But it's like it's like death and stupidity are the same thing um, because the people who are suffering from it don't know about it. It's everyone else around that suffers. Oh, yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, so so it's the people around you that suffer from whether you die or whether you're stupid. Right? That's so true. Yeah, It was a more eloquent quote quote than that. But I quite liked it. So, yeah, look, for, for me, like I said, and I touched on this briefly, because I've always had this, 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 I say always, but because as a young kid, and I remember it vividly having this fear of, of death, and certainly losing my parents is almost like something that in a certain way I've been training myself for. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird. Makes you sound like you're a ninja in, in the, That's right. in the yeah. foothills of yeah. Death Valley. You wouldn't be training for it to be a ninja in Death Valley. No, I know. But can wouldn't you think of like another valley? Shimano. When, yeah, but has that got anything to do with grief or passing away? No, but nor has training... Poppy, you're really going to have to get out of the way of the video. <laughs> Poppy. Yes, yes. What 
Blah, blah. Well, on that note, <laughs> I ask all of my guests. Stop it now. No, you can't get on the. This is why this. I don't like cats. Oh, they're fine. Look at him. All he's done is stare. He just wants to play. Shush. Right, the cat and dog are still at it. But I didn't ask you this before. Um, I ask all my guests now for an Instagram account or a podcast that they recommend. It doesn't have to be about grief or it doesn't have to be about mental health or anything. It's just an Instagram account or a podcast that you like, you enjoy, and that most importantly puts a smile on your face. Okay, um, so there's a couple on Instagram which 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 I'll always look at. One of them is, is well, actually, there's two of them pretty similar. The Archbishop of Banterbury, absolute top draw um, content. There's another one called British Memes. They yeah. often have similar kind of stuff. There's also one which I found. I think I shared it with you. It's simply called Look at This Russian. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, it, there's one with the guy smoking the fag, uh, like a farmer, and he's doing an interview on the television news about this dangerous curve C in corner, the car yeah. yeah and he's saying and it's, it's subtitles that and they came around the corner and just you know yesterday a car flips over and as he's talking this car comes literally flying barreling through the air past him he doesn't break a beat takes a drag in his fag and goes just like that and it's like <laughs> it's there's something about the way their culture russian culture is projected through these memes oh my god it's, it's so good um Okay, well, that's a good one. Lots of podcasts. One that, that I was recommended to by, by one of my guys at work is um, Gossip Mongers, um, which is um, uh, Joe Wilkinson, a stand-up comedian, and um, David Earl. Dave Earl who was Most of them you'd recognize from Afterlife. From the Ricky Gervais program as Ricky well. Ricky Gervais. Uh, that and, is Afterlife. And, yeah, the Ricky Gervais program, I said. Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah. And uh, it, it's it's them reading out urban myths and rumors that people have heard from their town or their school or whatever and that's very funny it is very funny and actually um <clears throat> chris mccarty robbie greenfield from dubai Eye, who i worked with a couple of times they i overheard them talking about it the other day and they said the same as you when you first listen to it it's very it's very british sense of humor when you first listen to it, it's a bit like, mm, but you you keep on and it is, it's very, very funny. It's so weird. Yeah. And, and obviously they, they read out four or five, maybe sometimes 10 in an episode. So they're not always brilliant, but they, but you know, when you look at some of the yeah. stories, some of the names that people have, and it's funny because you can think about walking around your town and some of the eccentric characters or, or people that there was rumours about something they'd done. Why is it, is it like in every town there's always like a pedo or something like... No, but... <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Is that is that like you need a cathedral to be a city? So in order no. to be a town you need a pedo? <laughs> so you go no. from village to town, Hamlet to village. Do you have a sexual predator in your midst? Um, I don't... No, but you know like... Charlie Chester, the child molester. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> he lived up Mountjoy. But I don't think he did. No, I don't think he did. I don't... I, I, if anyone who lives in Mountjoy in battle can confirm that. Yeah, but I... There, there are... But that's the thing. You'll see these characters that no one... Everyone sees, they're, they're, you know, you see them always about the town, but Weird no one Bob. knows about them. Weird Bob, the shaky twins. You remember them? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't remember them. Terrible. I remember Terrible. the the man that was dressed as a woman and used to have uh, just like lo like carrier bags full of teddies. And then there was what was the name of the the, the old guy from the top of no, but that Marley was, Lane? No, that was Pete. Was it Pete? Was yeah. his name? He had the little trolley full of stuff. He used toys. to paint his fingernails, fingernails and stuff. Yeah. He was just eccentric. Yeah, that's, they're just different people. Yeah. Yeah. A bit stabby. As well. <laughs> <laughs> what Pete? Yeah. <laughs> Mental Pete. <laughs> Mental Pete. Five Knives P, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but but and and that's what it's about. And it, it's it's but they obviously they read they read them out as they're written. And yeah. there's two things that are brilliant about it. The way some people or most people write them is brilliant. Genius. There, there's a lot of you know they use a lot of use of metaphor and stuff in there, and it's it's brilliant. And some of the the terms they use for everyday acts and stuff you think oh my god i've never heard that before yeah, yeah. um 
But what's it also, called again? Gossip mongers. Gossip mongers. But when they're when they're reading them out and they're, they're, they start cracking up and crying with laughter as well, it's, yeah. it's very good. So look at this Russian Archbishop of Banterbury and UK memes on Instagram, and uh, gossip mongers on um, podcast on podcast. And of course um, <clears throat> that grief relief podcast. In case you haven't found it, That's, if you haven't, I'd be slightly worrying. They might have found it on here, but not check the po- here being YouTube. I also didn't realise actually pointing it at the YouTube camera is that. <clears throat> A lot of people who watch the podcast on YouTube on their TV don't see the write-up. So there's been a couple of times, <clears throat> because I've been so wonderfully advanced with technology, whereby in one of the episodes, the camera ran out 10 minutes before the end, so it just goes to a logo. In episode four, the audio was really bad. So I write in the write-ups on the podcast and on YouTube, oh, this has happened, or this has happened, but quite a few people don't see that. Oh. And actually, they don't even read the write-up. So they don't even know who it is and what the situation is. And they just just go straight for it. Press play. But they auto play as well, right? So Yeah. They could just be watching any sorts of stuff and you just pop up and they just have you on the background with the hoovering. Yeah. Maybe no, I'd still. like to think that they listen intently to yeah. my podcast. Shh. Phones away. <laughs> my phone's on here. Which is slightly concerning. Right. Um Russell Avery, thank you very much. Don't know why I full named you. Um, <clears throat> if you have been affected by anything we've spoken about, as I've always said, I'm not a professional, but please reach out to me on social media uh, or email and I can certainly try and help and have a chat and put you in contact with the right people. On Instagram, it's at that grief relief podcast. On Twitter, it's grief relief pod, which is more than annoying. You can email me. It's that grief relief podcast at gmail.com. As always, Click like, click subscribe, give us a five star rating. Me. Okay. Share. 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 We like sharing. Oh. Um, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's always fun. Yeah, it's share things because now on Instagram, just liking stuff does nothing for the algorithm. I don't know. No, I don't know. Um, that's it. Thanks, Russell Overy. Pleasure. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.